after years of crafting functional pottery, in 1991, artist Ann Weber began working with cardboard, wanting to eliminate the cumbersome process of clay and create larger forms that were lightweight. Inspired by Frank Gehry's cardboard furniture, which transformed an everyday material into structurally sound and appealing functional objects, Anne began using this often discarded resource to build monumental forms that expand the possibilities of resourcefulness and beauty. With a BA in Art History from Purdue University and an MFA from the California College of Arts and Crafts, Anne studied under artist Viola Fry, whose large-scale sculptures influenced her work. Anne bends, twists, weaves and staples ragged strips of cardboard into organic abstractions that hang on walls or stand dramatically in a space. Her work has been described as if she has merged the purity of Romanian sculptor Brancusch and Dada artist Arp with the rawness of Arta Pavera, art that uses throwaway materials. These forms appear relatively simple in their sweeping, bulging silhouettes, but the sculptures are richly complex in surface patterns and details. Neither entirely representational or abstract, but something in between. They are elegant and impeccably crafted and can stand strong at six to eight feet tall. They allude to bodies, human and animal. They form bold geometric patterns that give the work a jazzy, graffiti-like feel that is fearless and striking far removed from its humble beginnings. Working on individual series of works, Anne chronicles her personal life and the events of our time using the sculptures as allegories. As curator Duet Cheng says, Anne Weber's large sculptures made from woven strips of cardboard synthesize ancient and modern, craft and high art. The biomorphic gourd shapes suggest traditional basketry, but also with their human size, their open grids, peepholes, pre-industrial coffins or cages, and their probing necks, smokestacks or chimneys. They're imbued with life and as anthropomorphic as Giorgio Mirandi's bottles. So let's find out more about this amazing transformation of material as we welcome Ann Weber, who joins us from San Pedro, California, as this week's Friday Feature Artist. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And that was such a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. I mean, there was so much I had to kind of squeeze into that tiny intro and there's much more that um, uh, that could have been said. But um, yes, welcome. And welcome to everyone uh, tuning in, wherever you are from. Let us know uh, where you're tuning in from. And um, welcome. We'd love to hear from everyone uh, listening with us today, tomorrow, yesterday. So firstly, I mean, we and me, I'm just in awe of everything that you have accomplished. Um, it's just so much. And I read that, um, so going back a little bit, so the description of yourself as a hippie potter in the 70s and then as a functional potter selling to Bloomingdale's and Barney's in New York, I mean, all of that presents quite a visual image. Can you explain the term functional pottery and then how that part of your creative life kind of came to a close? Yes, um, the longer one lives, the more time one has to get things done. And that's one of the beauties of being 72 years old. Um, and speaking of 1972, that's when I graduated from college. Um, I fell in love twice. One was with the medium of clay. The other was with the man sitting next to me on the potter's wheel. And we decided uh, in 1972 that we were going to be potters and that we were going to uh, move to a, a location in the United States where we could buy land and open a store. And we started making functional pottery, which just is uh, cups, bowls, plates, teapots on the potter's wheel and rented a little grocery store on the outskirts of town, put a curtain up, lived behind the curtain, built the kiln in the backyard, made a little showroom uh, out of old barn wood and stuck a shingle out. And we started selling pottery 
wow. right, right away. And, um, and I mean, I'll be mentioning your Instagram probably several times, but on your Instagram, I did see that there was a black and white photo taken by Bill Cunningham, the uh, famous street photographer of you in your studio during that time. And that was just so evocative. And um, I'm going to try not to use the word wow so many times in this conversation, but, you know, having your photo taken by Bill Cunningham, that is pretty wow. <laughs> Well, when, uh, after living in upstate New York, Ithaca, New York, about five hours from New York City, I moved down to New York City, uh, fell in love again, so second marriage, and I, I say that I, I, uh, I, I married into an apartment on Perry Street in the West Village, and when you're in New York City and you get uh, your 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 artwork in the newspaper. The newspaper is the New York Times. Wow. And uh, they are interested in sending over a photographer, then they send over Bill Cunningham. That's one of the beautiful things about living in a major metropolitan area like, like I have done uh, for most of my career. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, that was a that was a great opportunity. However, uh, I moved to New York City in the early the 80s and that was the beginning of disco it was sort of the end of the crafts movement and a lot of us that have been working for 10 or 15 years were starting to burn out so that's when i uh i took a class with a another uh potter who was making more one-of-a-kind art full objects out of clay and he said go to California and go to graduate school because that's where people are using clay as an artistic material, not as a functional craft. Yeah. So that was a huge turning point. And so I applied to different graduate schools. I chose the one with a, a woman in control who was Viola Fry. And uh, she was making, uh, oh, 10 and 12, 15 foot ceramic artwork. And that really inspired me, uh, you know, especially going from four inch or 10 inch plate. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I wanted, to, so I made a lot of artwork that was bigger. Yeah. And I just want to uh, let you know that we've got lots of people joining us today. So thanks, Anna. Welcome. And uh, Janice. Just always good to know where everyone's joining us from. And it's great to be able to get the two different time zones. So that's amazing too. Um, yeah, so that was actually going to be one of my next questions that you then enrolled at the uh, California College of Arts and Crafts, now CCA, and Viola Fry. And um, that was the question, how did she influence the path that you took? So that was obviously, um, as you said, working in sort of the larger things compared to the, the sort of small. Um, and then, um, so then the switch then to cardboard in the early 90s. Um, yeah, how, how did you? Well, let, let me back up a little bit because you can only imagine what it's like to come in as a craftsperson and going to graduate at school and they tell you to go upstairs and start making art. And she said, well, you have a semester to build an art portfolio because we're not going to accept you into graduate school with a pottery portfolio, <laughs> you know, looking down their nose at that. So I was petrified. I was 35 years old. I felt like I might have made a terrible mistake leaving a prosperous business in New York City, coming all the way across the country, dragging my husband across. And so I went to her classes for 18 year olds or beginning classes and just watched how she worked. Mm -hmm. And one time she said, to, she noticed me in the background, of course, and she said, well, Anne, just go, go look at some real art, go look at Kandinsky. So I marched myself over to the library. I checked out a Kandinsky book. I brought it back to my little studio, set it in front of a potter's wheel and started throwing abstract forms. That was a huge eureka moment for me because it took me from, from functional craft to fine art. And that, 
once I started making those forms on the wheel, then I could make larger forms that were hand built. And ultimately, those are some of the forms that I'm still making today. Yeah, but that's also, so, that's, sorry, just to interrupt, but that's also, um, you know, your, the way that you connect those things, because Kandinsky, you know, has a lot of sort of lines and explosions and the fact that you then took that to make into forms, um, you know, if you'd said something more like the Moriandi shapes or the Klaus Oldenburg, you kind of get that. But to take Kandinsky and then have that as your inspiration, I mean, yeah, that's already out there. But they were the forms, the shapes. Um, right. it, it wasn't the explosions or the big blast <laughs> color. Um, <laughs> I'm, there's another artist that I can't quite remember who also, Moreau, Moreau influenced me too because he was a painter predominantly and he made simple, beautiful forms. So that was, that was my transition. Mm -hmm. And then to address your question, how I got to cardboard is that after graduate school, my teacher says you're a beginning artist for the first 10 years. That is so liberating because it doesn't mean that whatever your last body of work is, that's what you're gonna be working on. So I experimented with a lot of different things. I left clay because I knew I wasn't gonna set up an expensive pottery studio with kilns uh, because I wanted to make large pieces. Uh, and so I experimented with plaster, very immediate. You could build great big forms. They were heavy. That was a problem. Um, Klaus Oldenburg influenced me because of his canvas pieces. And my father worked for a canvas company. So he sent me a big roll of canvas so I would make big shapes and stuff them full of bleach bottles and rolled up newspapers. And then it was uh, paper mache. I was influenced because of Nikki de St. Fally. And, uh, but then about, I guess it may be six or seven years out of school, I was moving to different studios, you know, tiny studios. And then all of a sudden I got a bigger one with stairs. So no elevator, no way to move the plaster pieces. So a lot of pieces just got recycled. But I was sitting in the middle of the studio with a big pile of cardboard boxes from the move that I had flattened. And then I had another eureka moment just in like, oh, here's another material. Um, thinking about Frank Geary's cardboard furniture that you mentioned in the intro. And I, I, I figured that I could cut them into strips and somehow weave them together or something, grommet them. And then at the hardware store, I saw somebody with a stapler <laughs> like this. And, and I realized that I could take this stapler. Let's see, how does this work? And staple <laughs> strips together. Can you see what I'm yeah. doing here? But the, the, one of the words that really struck me is the word weaving. I mean, and then I could make. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, just, um, you know, that that word weaving is so integral and is not necessarily sort of obvious that, oh, I've got cardboard and I've got a staple gun. Now I'm going to weave. Um, had you done any other kind of weaving before or you just sort of thought that was a great way to bring the material together? No, no. and I think of them more as stapling these strips together to make coil yeah. knots. But then I get, you know, you get tired of that. So then I thought, well, I'm just going to weave them. And it goes faster if you're weaving it. There's some images that you showed that are obvious in my website and on my Instagram, where you can see that I actually am doing weaving. Yeah. But I don't really, I don't associate myself with the weaving movement or even the craft movement so much, but I have a huge debt to the craft movement. Uh, because of all those years. And I also feel that the forms that I use today are very similar to all those years of throwing pots where you start with a ball of clay 
and then you pull it up into a cylinder. So yeah. basically, it's like you put a seed in the ground and the first thing that happens is a sprout. And so I'm very interested in those sort of primal forms, C cylinders and circles. They're, they're fr from nature. They identify as male and female. So those th that's sort of my connection to the craft world, but also just to nature. Yeah. That's I love that. And often when people embark on a creative career, you know, there's always the voices from everyone else, the sort of, but why? Why are you doing that? And for people starting ceramics, you know, people, other people, the voices would be, are you going to sell it at markets? You know, what is your why, why, why? But that's the thing, like, you don't know where things are going to lead. And so that's really interesting that that early start in ceramics has led to that amazing sculpture behind you that who would have thought so yeah so now we should uh, I'm sure people are itching more to get back to the um, work so we need to show we're going to show lots of images and we've also got the video of you making which I know everyone's going to love so let's just look at this one here um, so I can see why monumental is used to describe your work um, and listening to you talk on one of your um, videos that you've kindly put on YouTube, you were talking that you don't always need a big space to create something, which is um, interesting. So the two things I wanted to ask about this piece is um, I heard you talk about this piece in terms of um, valuing professional photography. So maybe tell us a bit more about the piece and then perhaps how the photo came about. That piece was made in the winter of uh, 2021 in a rainstorm in the basement. The, the water was flowing through. I had a dirt floor basement. I had to put those things on, on those wooden pallets. And I did them in three sections. And I had measured them fairly carefully, but they wouldn't go out the door. And I had to take the window apart to shove the big middle piece there. And I, I didn't see these together I, I, until I took them to the photographer's studio. Um, I work with Lee Fothery in Oakland, who is the, one of the best photographers in, in the Bay Area, He's still working, and he loved my work. And it, it was a godsend, really, because I, he had photographed Viola's work and knew that I was a student of hers. And uh, so I, you know, I had to rent a truck. I had to help him move things around the studio and make a whole paint a wall. It took like three days and I knew it was going to cost thousands, um, but it didn't matter because this was a commission. It was going to go into a museum. It also was one of the best pieces that I did ever made. I knew it was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we got it there. We, and we put it together with ladders, the two of us propped it up. And then he photographed. Or then when we walked back to and turned around, we both of us were just so blown away by these pieces. And he sent me a bill for about $500. And I said, Lee, I, I, I can't accept that. And he, and he got mad at me. He said, you don't tell me how to run your business. You don't tell me how to run things. And he said, if you use these photographs, they will take you to another level. And he was right. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. That's yeah. Amazing. I'll just show another one from maybe a few years later too, which um, just to yeah, get. I am in my studio this time, but there are so many people that have helped me get where I ha am. And, and I have never had a great big studio. Well, one time I did for about 10 years, but I have worked in the worst possible things you can imagine. I had a studio fire. I, I've worked in abandoned buildings, worked in tiny little basements of other people when, after the studio burned down. So, um, it, it is a it's a crazy yeah life. it's good to pull back that curtain um you know the metaphorically creative curtain and just kind of know sometimes uh the reality behind <clears throat> excuse me when people are creating because otherwise we have that you know um 
fantasy that you're in this massive space in LA doing these huge sculptures, which you may be, but um, it's good to know the truth. So I think we need to do no, no. Let's, um, we've still got people joining us and I think we really need to show now um, you doing the making. So, yes, let's play this and everyone, I'm sure you'll love it. <laughs> Wow, thank you. That was just, I mean, it's one thing to hear you talk about it, but to see you do that and being able to just to pop into your studio over your shoulder there. So there's several things that struck me about that is that it, this, it, it looks so physical, but you also make it look so effortless. And even the way you kind of just, I want to say not hack, but just do those strips free form with the knife. It's just incredible. Um, and so... Are you often working on several pieces at once? Is that part of the process? 
Well, when I make the armatures, uh, which are the cardboard inside, um, for instance, the series that that you saw, which was six pieces, uh, those are number, I think, about 46. I've done, you know, 40 pieces before that. And so I have maybe 12 more that are ready to go. And uh, so that series, I'm thinking, will be be up to a hundred pieces. Wow. Um, and so I'll, I'll make the armatures. So, because that's more the creative part, that's kind of physical down on the floor. Uh, but then when I start stapling them, then it's more relaxing. Um, and I do, uh, I, I work maybe three to four hours in the studio, not more than that, because I do, I get tired and, uh, I, I want to, I don't want to wear my hands out because they're yeah. in good shape. Um, but yeah, it, I, I love the fact that it's clean and it's lightweight and I can move it around that. I got sick of that with clay. I didn't, I didn't like being dirty and heavy and no. So th this really suits me. I, I, I love just taking something and uh, making out of nothing and making these big, beautiful forms. I'm, I'm yeah. from, from the Midwest. So uh, one of our virtues is resourcefulness. So <laughs> anybody can make beautiful sculpture with bronze or marble or silver or gold, but it's the clever person that can make a sculpture. Yeah. Out. And now it looks special out of cardboard. Now more than ever. And um, yes, thanks, Janice. I'm sure you speak for many of us. It was, um, yeah, because how else? We can't possibly imagine um, any any other way. And uh, thank you, Bernadette, as well. Fantastic. Great opportunity. Um, and uh, so I noticed that um, you use the polyurethane too to finish the um, sculptures off and that kind of gives them that beautiful finish and, and, and it's really interesting then that it takes it from that sort of street level to gallery level um, as, a, as a sort of, you know, definite finish. Uh, so let's go look at some more of the work, I think. I, th I think it takes it out of the gutter and makes it look like patent leather shoes. So I, I sort of like that reference. And it serves other purposes as well. It bonds the cardboard strips together and protects oh. them. And it ensures that the cardboard will last more than 100 years because it's spar varnish. It's a water base, but it's used in, in uh, outdoor uh, decks and on boats. So it's a really, it costs $50 a gallon. So uh, it's not cheap, but it's really important. And then it, you know, it makes the surfaces easier to clean. You just clean them with a feather duster. <laughs> so true. And so these shapes, I mean, they are just amazing. Can you tell us um, about what the thinking or the, um, yeah, behind this piece, these pieces? Oh, this is the same one that's behind me. It's one of my absolute favorites. It's called Miracles in Wonder. And I want my sculptures to have a lot of different readings. And I also like the fact that they are anthropomorphic, like Mirandi. And uh, but so this one sort of can reference um the Madonna and child, but my version of it is that the mother is the little one the, and the child takes on this huge presence. I have a daughter and, uh, it, you know, they run your life. They, they can make or break it. They, they, uh, but you, you are so consumed with love and, and, and anxiety for their success and for them to be okay in the world. So I feel like that that's the miracle and the wonder of giving birth and being a mother, but also the, the child just takes over. So, yeah. but you know, someone else might have a completely different read from that sculpture. And I, I really like that. Yeah. yeah. That's such an amazing ob um, observation. Yeah. It's so true. Um, and then this one as well. Oh, you're my butterfly. That came out of a four-day love affair I had in Rome that just about killed me. <laughs> but uh, 
<laughs> the love affair didn't last, but my love affair with Rome did. And this one's called You're My Butterfly. And it was just about this, this beautiful Roman. And um, so you just never know where your ideas are coming from. I did a whole series on that. You can understand why Picasso had all those muses. <laughs> Uh, and so you mentioned Rome there, and there's a fabulous um, video um, on your YouTube of you collecting cardboard in Rome as the most stylish um, cardboard collecting woman in a near a bin that I've ever seen. Um, was that the time that you had the residency in Rome, um, that you were there? Yes, it was. And in fact, that the love affair spurred me to figure out a way to get back to Rome. And so I just started Googling artists and res residencies in Rome. And what came up was the American Academy in Rome. And they had a visiting artists and scholars program that, that anyone in the world can apply for. And you are in a incredible villa with almost a hundred other people who are prize winners and their traveling companions, scholars, choreographers, dancers, um, visual artists of all kinds. And you, uh, you write a proposal, uh, you lay your money down, which is also, it's a very, very good price for what you get. I got a studio that was about 800 square feet overlooking the city of Rome. I had a little bed sit with a bathroom down the hall. And every night I had dinner with, with some of the great minds of, of the of the United States and also other residents who were invited to come from other countries. Wow. And so I went back three times um, for one month each time. The last time I was there was 2018. Mm -hmm. And every year I apply for the Rome Prize. And one year I got close. I, I was a finalist, but didn't wow. happen. And, uh, but I did undeterred i went back the very next year and spent another month there and it just changed my life it made me aware of how much more i was capable of you know you think you don't have the capacity to read intellectual um documents or to read ovid or or uh, um fill yeah. in the blank um but you know, you're at the table and, and your work is just as important as someone else's. And yeah. it was just such an extraordinary experience. It opened up so many gates for me. And I encourage all of you to go to the American Academy in Rome and look up the Visiting Artists and Scholars Program. They have applications available. I think it's three times a year. Wow. So just go and go yeah. for at least four weeks, not two. You need the because it's yeah such an you adjustment painted, painted <laughs> that such, rarefied part. you painted such a wonderful um visual image of that and uh, it does sound so inspirational but um one of the talks that i was listening to um did you it sounded like you didn't come back with your work you you um finished there in, in such a wonderful way can you tell us do you, do you know what I'm referring to? Oh, yes, exactly. Because there, there, I just decided I was going to pull out the stops. I had a big, great big space and wonderful, beautiful Roman cardboard, the beautiful colors. And, and usually I would uh, scavenge from a... Uh, a dumpster that was right in front of a liquor store. So, uh, and I wanted to impress people. It was my first time there. And so I made large work. And then I had uh, at the last week, the last few days after everything was finished and I polyurethaned it there, then uh, I had a party party and served bellinis and pizza and invited anyone who wanted to come and they could sign up and we would have a raffle and people could take the work, you know, people that were residents there for the year. And um, I had a great photographer come in. Um, that's the other thing. You have access to so many highly professional people. And this is the same photographer that photographs for the museums in Rome. Oh. And so he comes to the American Academy, of course, because, you know, 
There's a lot of good artists there. So I had beautiful photographs of the work and I had plenty of work at home. And uh, so it was, it, it felt great to be able to do that and to let go of it. Yeah. Um, the third time I was there, I did bring the artwork home and uh, I measured the largest box that I could ship DHL and, uh, and I had, I think, four boxes, and it was fifteen hundred dollars a fortune. But I did. I wanted those pieces. They were experimental. I mm -hmm. I have one of them still. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is that's an issue when you're traveling. So, but have yeah, I love that idea. Apple, I could go anywhere in the world with this thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you weren't pay, paying for the weight. Um, and so referring back to the video and you just held up the staple gun, I don't know if this was a secret, um, but, yes, I was wondering that too, where you had the little hole, um, whether in the video there was a little hole and um, the staple gun wouldn't have gone in there. So I think Marilyn wanted to know how, um, how did you secure the hole or was it left as a hole in that piece? It was left as a hole. Ah, oh, interesting. Of it. Sometimes I back myself into a corner and there might be more than one hole, but that, but they all have a little hole that are the closed forms. Weaving, I don't have to think about that, but with the closed forms like the one behind me, there, there's a little hole. And I actually like the metaphor for that because it reminds me of the Membrace pottery who were, uh, it was a Native American tribe in the plains of the Southwest. And when somebody died, they uh, made a commemorative bowl and painted it and then punched a hole in it and laid it over the area where the person was buried and so that his spirit could get out. And mm. I just love that story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I've got some more of your work here. Could you um, tell us a bit more about this piece? Because um, obviously different to the other, uh, the uh, sphere rounded shapes, but still, um, yeah, incredible. It's called We Three and it references my family, my husband, my former husband and my daughter and myself. And you can see that that I made one shape and then the cardboard that was, for instance, if I cut out a piece on the right, um, and a, I make an armature that's, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 feet tall. And then there was the other piece. If you could go back to that picture, please. Yep. And then I cut out this big triangular piece, double triangles, and then next to it, are other shapes that are that are mimicking the 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 piece, and so that's the next piece. And then there was, a, a, and then I cut that one out, and there was the other thing. And I I just use what is left from the first piece. And to me, that's another metaphor for how we are all connected. Um, I, I, for that piece, I also, I didn't make it look perfect. I think I moved them around a little bit mm -hmm. so that the negative space would be a little more different, but there's other pieces that you have that, uh, where you can really see that there's, yes, that one exactly one piece after the other. And those pieces, I, they're called the personages series. And I've done about 30 of these and, and I did them as an homage to a period in my life when I was going through some obstacles and I was sick and I had to go through treatment for a year. And then it took me another year to recover. And there were so many people that helped me and I had no idea so many people loved me. And so I created one piece after the other that was sort of an homage to all these different people. But then again, it was also the fact that we are all connected. So I love that art sort of teaches me that and that it, it you think that you're just following a certain thread and then all of a sudden the thread leads to purpose and meaning. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and 
and I love too that um, how I've heard you say that one piece affects or informs the other one in in that sort of um, series too, which is really interesting. And the negative space is um, is just really interesting too there. Um, and then I think this idea of um, you know that they're not painted that you use the actual um, printing on the cardboard itself in but it it does work so well and I like that description that I came across of that sort of jazzy graffiti description too because um, it, it does. <laughs> Yes, and, and this is sort of a continuation of the personages, but I also was really amazed in Los Angeles that there was a lot of graffiti on the walls um, and all over the place. But in, in my town especially, I mean, on grocery stores and just any vacant wall in an alley. And I did a little research and I found out that the, that the shapes were rounded and sort of, and also very pointy, like Gothic uh, script. Mm -hmm. And I found out that there were a lot of people from Latin America that came to Los Angeles in the 30s and in, from Central America. And people were very um, territorial, but they lived in, you know, the the Nicaraguans would live near each other. The Mexicans would live near each other. And people were very proud of their heritage and they would form clubs. And it's sort of the precursor to gangs, but it was really more about community and people would write their names on a wall in mm -hmm. Gothic script. And that came from almost a hundred years ago. And so yeah. that kind of form is still uh, being used today. So not only is this about figures, but it also feels like it's about hieroglyphs and also communication between us and how we communicate. And, uh, and yeah, the, the colors here were so vibrant. And, and that was the thing about Los Angeles is the light here where it's always sunny. The sky is always blue, except for this year, we've had a lot of rain, but you know, there's so much, it, it's so bright and it's yeah. so beautiful. So the, I started using more color, uh, although my heart is always with more of the simple shapes, but, um, and with, you know, white and you know, kind of neutral colors, but cardboard boxes from the wine stores come in all kinds of yeah. colors. So there's no painting going yeah. on here. And I also love the idea of having text because in another way, it's sort of like text messaging. And, you know, there's this constant struggle, especially nowadays where you're, you want to do what you want to do and you have your own vision, but there's a, sort of a pressure to make your artwork relevant to the contemporary canon or to the, the, I mean, I, my work is not political. And so I don't feel like I make political work, but I feel like there, people really want to know how you are engaging with things that are happening in the world yeah and so you say that and so I love that, that when I think about everything. that you have a nod to things so I'm just going to show this one and if you can um explain the title and the thinking behind that one. Oh, that was done at the beginning of the pandemic and and it was uh oh my God, there was so much going on. It's called, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And we, by this time, we'd already had uh, the, the, the president that did not represent me. Um, and there just felt like there was so much division and, 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 isolation and just all this stuff. And so this was sort of a weather vane that, and it's from a Bob Dylan song. And I've done another sculpture that's also called that from another period. So um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I don't, I, I, I leave it sort of loose because I don't want it to just be about one thing. You know, yeah. I, I, I want it to, I want the title to just be a little clue as to what I might've been thinking, but uh yeah. You know, you have to nail me on it. That's what it is. But I, I'd almost prefer to not even tell you what 
it's yeah and you do it so well and again another song title this one yeah that one is um dance me to the end of love and it, it was the, the the fact that all these young people couldn't even you know they're in high school and they want to go out on dates and they want to meet men and women and whoever they want to be with but they couldn't and so this felt like it was limiting but it was also there's still this joyfulness that love will never stop and this is using Mondrian's colors and he made a painting called Broadway Boogie Woogie that he made in 1943 in the depths of World War II and the Holocaust and people, you know, where artists were living with and with no heat, no water, and and in these in these god awful factory uh, warehouses. So you think about him looking out of his window and seeing Broadway and the taxis and the red lights and the white lights and the slivers of blue sky. So I, just, I also felt that, you know, no matter what is going on, you have to hold on to, 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 to beauty and joy and wonder. So yeah, yeah that's so that's true. In, in one of your talks, I um talking about that work, I heard you, um, you know, reference um, the de Koonings and um, what they were going through. And it reminded me of that great book, The Women of Ninth Street, where it shows a light on, um, yeah, you just don't think about those artists that fled World War II and ended up in New York. And like you say, they had no heating and they just, yeah, all the struggles that they went through um, certainly keeps us in check of what we, um, you know, what we have. Um, and I just love to this, we were talking about the cardboard, but then you've got this with a completely different, I mean, it, it's not bronze, is it? It's cardboard. Oh, no, it's oh, bronze. Oh, it's bronze. It is. Oh, okay. It is bronze. And that was made in 2016. I had an uh, art dealer in San Francisco that was taking my work to one of the art fairs in Miami. Me. And uh, so she decided to cast this and uh, it's still around. It's interesting because um, people tend to prefer the cardboard. Uh -huh. I don't sell a lot of work. And I always say that, you know, I have taken care of my artwork. It has not taken care of me. I've always had a part-time job and uh but the the bronze is you know it can go outside yeah. and right now i am working on a series of four sculptures that are going to be cast in bronze for a public art commission in emeryville but they're going to be painted oh. the colors of bright cardboard oh interesting so i think that, that yeah. is going to be cast. yeah yeah, but if anybody wants to buy that bronze sculpture, it's available. <laughs> so uh, just get in touch with me and I'll forward yeah. your name to the heart. Well, that was two questions. One of them was going to be, have you ever had anything cast? So you've just answered that. And then the other thing, which you just touched on there, I heard you, um, it was a great quote that you say that you've always supported your art and your art has not supported you. Um, so, and fearless, I think that's one of the words I associate with you when I was looking at everything that you've accomplished. So what what keeps you creating? Well, I think that the fact that making something out of nothing gives me a great feeling of satisfaction. And I think that we all want to have meaning and purpose in our lives. And I think that you know, from the minute I touch clay, making something out of nothing, I just feel that even though I, did, I wasn't brought up in a household that valued art, I don't think I'd even been to an art museum until I was 20. And, um, and it was the craft movement that drew me in. And then it was the art movement that more I learned uh, being in New York City during the revival of the painting movement with Julie and Schnabel and all those California artists that had moved to New York City. And uh, I think I was just always enamored with, with uh, the idea of being an artist and the fact that I could be an yeah. artist. And when I worked with Viola, she taught me how to be an artist. She taught me how to go from one thing to the other, unwilling mentor. She used to say, you know, if you're going to teach, just 
be a good enough teacher, save the best part of yourself for your own work. And that was such a great model because she worked like a dog. She did not ever have relationships. She's, she was so dog dogmatic. Artists don't travel except for their work. You know, why bother celebrating the holidays? You're giving up 16 days of work. I mean, I'm not <laughs> like that, believe me. But um, I, I felt that there's nothing I'd rather spend my time doing, yeah. you know, and I, so I also spend three to four hours on the computer, putting things together. Today, I was meeting with my art dealers. Um, I had a sale that came through that had to be negotiated with them. Um, I'm working on the, the plans for installing the work for the bronze piece. I mean, the day just goes by. And wow. Definitely. Today, I didn't even get to the studio, but I'm, I'm getting ready to go to Mexico for a, a artist in residency that I have hosted and sponsored. So I'm, I'm going to look forward to a lot of time just to do some writing and some yes. drawing. And I'm taking some time away from the studio because I have a lot of work. So I feel like when there's so much work in the studio. That's when I sort of double down on, you know, doing more newsletters and making sure I'm caught up with my posts. And, you know, I also do some small work that's available to support Angels Gate Cultural Center, which yes. is where I have my studio I was going to in ask San that. Pedro. Yes. Um, yeah. We, um, so the two things I wanted to ask about that was, um, so the idea that art can have a purpose and you've got this Angels Gate project and we can put a link in. Um, can you tell us more a little bit about the um, Angel Gate project? Well, it is, um, it's a place where I have my studio with 50 other artists. They're old Navy barracks that were built in the 40s. So they're <laughs> they're not in very good shape and the walls are very thin and they weren't built to last. And the ceilings aren't very high, but you know, artists will find a way to take something and recycle it and turn it into studios. So we have a great uh, staff of people that coordinate exhibitions and they have classes that people can take in the community. So I feel very strongly that one should always be involved in some kind of organization relating to art. I have always been, I've served on committees, I've been on public art um, advisory councils for, and for public art, for different organizations, for different cities. Um, so the cause that I am most supportive, one is the American Academy in Rome, and I have mm -hmm. set up a, 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 a residency with my estate from my Los Angeles house after I die. And then the other thing that is close to my heart is Angels Gate Cultural Center. So I have, they organize system where artists can sell their work through a Shopify site that is set up by the organization and a certain percentage of all sales goes to the organization and then the bulk of the sales goes to the mm -hmm. artist. And I also wanted to make small works because most people can afford a a piece for $175, but not something for $32,000. So yeah. I have a real range of my prices. So it's your friends and your colleagues and your artists, people that come to your openings and support you. And yet they're not able to buy something. So I really wanted to make small works that is available. So that is uh, that that hits two birds with yeah. one stone. That sounds like a great initiative. And also, um, I heard you say this idea of um, nobody sees our work unless we shine a light on it. And, you know, you have 59,000 followers on Instagram and uh, you do an amazing job of uh, sharing a lot about your work and your process. So I'm guessing that you're a fan of social media. So how would you say it works for you and how do you use it or engage with it? Well, I have always been a tentative person about social media. 
And I started my site maybe 10 years ago, but didn't do much with it. And then during the pandemic, I just completely stopped because it just felt like, what's the point? You don't want to be talking about your artwork when everyone is suffering so much. But then when things started to open up a little bit and people started getting interested in online purchases, like everybody was buying everything online. And then all of a sudden there were some platforms that art galleries were making work available online. Mm -hmm. And so I ran into a woman at a gathering and she was a social media consultant. So when I went back to Instagram, I had no idea what I was doing. Didn't know what a story was or a real idea how to even post. So I started working with her every week and she started to teach me how to do things. And she started to help me, you know, put together newsletters. And so she and I came up with the plan that I was going to do two posts every week. And I was that no matter what. And it takes me about an hour to do a post because you want to do something meaningful. Don't want to just put an image up there and just some few words. I want to, I want to engage people. I want to connect with people. And I want to, and I, I've learned from other, looking at other people's uh, posts that I admired that they either talked a lot about their work or they talked about their process and, you know, how they became an artist and why they're an artist. So I started talking about those things. And, um, and then I went from about 4,000 to 15,000. I thought that was amazing. Mm -hmm. But then I noticed one of the people that I had been inspired by, Studio Q in Oakland, K-I-E-U, went all the way, she was all the way up to 50,000. So we follow each other. So I said, hey, how did that happen? And she said, real. <laughs> so I started reels. It's, it's not much different than just doing a post. You just attach a certain number of images. I also started, you know, with guidance and encouragement from my social media consultant, Nicole Slater Consulting. Put that in the notes. <laughs> and uh, she has really taken me to another level. And uh, it's just being accountable and consistent. And all of a sudden, the algorithm just grabbed onto me, and I would have sometimes up to two or three thousand new followers a week. Wow! Now, that's amazing. Month, and you didn't even have to do a silly dance or anything. No dancing. A, a, a little, to, you know, dog and pony show a bit, but you try to keep it honest and authentic. But now, within the last month, I could barely scrape together a hundred new followers a week. Yeah. So it's, it's a changing based, you know, things change. And then I thought that's fine because I even thought once I got to 50, why do I need to do more? But then I realized that I like the process. I love hearing from people all over the world yeah. and I like commenting and introduced to new work and finding out what's going on in my community and who's having a show because people are great about posting that. So I think my, my love hate relationship has grown to acceptance and uh, finding a way that I can be honest and authentic and consistent because it has opened up so many doors for me. I don't think you would have found me without Instagram. Yeah, no, this it has been a, an amazing resource, um, you know, personally, and then just, you know, to find and connect people and to have all these wonderful talks. And particularly in the last few years, as um, we haven't all been able to travel, it's just been fabulous being able to beam into um, people like yourself, studios, and just have that connection, which has been great. I can't believe that our hour is nearly up. It's just gone so fast and we've barely just scratched the surface. Um, one thing I was wondering, like, do you, how do you stay focused? Do you get distracted easily or you just um, have like a, a sort of vision? Is that, do you have things mapped out or, um, yeah. Um, I have a structure to my days. I work Monday through Friday. I take Saturday and Monday off and, and socialize, have dinner parties, go to dinner parties, meet up with friends, go see art. And so um, I, you know, you got to do your yoga, you got to get your walk in. 
uh, three to four hours of office work. And then it's my relaxing time to be in the studio. And I like to have it at the end of the day. And then when it's seven o'clock, man, I'm out of there. I want to get home. I want to have a nice dinner. Um, I love cooking for myself and uh, cook a big pot the last few days. And then I come home and read. I don't usually watch streaming or stuff like that. I'd love to keep up on, on my magazines yeah. and the New York Times and then my novels nonfiction where I'm learning about other artists. So my days are really full. Yeah. And we don't have a huge amount of time to um, discuss this, but I know that um, you moved from the Bay Area to San Pedro a few years ago, um, and that must have been a huge, uh, like, life-changing sort of uh, decision and a lot of upheaval. Um, do you think that physical move created a shift in your work or your inspiration? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think, what did Obama say? I know what I'm doing and I'm fearless. <laughs> there is something really powerful about those words. And I have uprooted myself and gotten rid of bad husbands and boyfriends when the time. So anyway, I ran into a friend in 2015, eight years ago, that said that he'd had more opportunities and interest in his artwork in eight months in Los Angeles after he moved down here than 12 years in San Francisco. And I thought, oh, shoot, I, I missed the boat. I'm, can't, I've been here 30 years since graduate school. I, too, I can't leave my community. And then the next Day I woke up and I said, Ooh, and where would you like to spend your last 20 years? You're 65. Would you like to go to Los Angeles and be in the center of the art world? I mean, Los Angeles is really happening. New museums, galleries are flooding here from all over the world. There's such a huge community. I was able to find a reasonably priced studio in an industrial town. San Pedro is on the ocean and on the port of Los Angeles. I mean, there is not a fancy restaurant here. There's hard to find a good cup of coffee, <laughs> but it's a very blue collar town. And, uh, and, and the celebrities are if you're a longshoreman. And I really, really like this kind of environment. And it reminds me a little bit of my hometown in, in the Midwest in Indiana. So it really suited me. I was able to buy a house um, in 2016 when, when prices were a little better. And it has, it has just opened up wow. so many opportunities. Yeah. Still the problem is selling artwork. Yeah. That is the hardest part. And uh, that's why I have always had a part-time job. Now I have social security. Now I have a little money coming in from the smaller work sales. And it, I have rented out a room in Airbnb. Yeah. So, you know, Resourceful. again, very I think those, I mean, that is a beautiful way to kind of wrap up the talk, but um, those key words that I'm definitely going to so associate you with you are uh, inspirational, fearless, resourceful, and um, just hearing your story and those uh, things to think about has all just been um, incredible. So thank you so much for giving us so much to think about um, in today's talk. I was going to say something else then, but I've got a bit of a cold and I've got a bit of a brain fog, so I can't remember what it was. Let me just say one thing. In it's really important to have a great mailing list and all you artists who have open studios ought to have a book out there so that people can sign up and that you can send them things for their from for your newsletter and then make announcements about your shows so on that note if anyone wants to be on my newsletter you can either get in touch with tara or you can get in touch with me my email is transparent it's on my website it's on my instagram there is no reason to hide your email don't put up a firewall where people have to put their name in and request something make yourself easy to Definitely. get in touch with because then people can find you 
they can find you, they can find your art. And that's the whole point. Yes, exactly. Sometimes artists do make, they're, they're, they are their own worst enemies trying to find them or they've got different cutesy names on their Instagram and you can't remember their actual name. And then you go to their website and it's like 15 years old and you can't actually find the work. And yeah, sometimes they just make it hard. I know what it was. It was that quote that you had about um, artists will continue to make work whether there's a market for it or not. So something like that, um, which was, yeah. That's the truth. <laughs> so I am going to wrap this up and it's been fabulous and I'm sure everyone really enjoyed that. So if you can put your comments of gratitude and thanks into um, the box below, we'd love to hear from um, everybody. Um, and I'm sure we all appreciate it. Uh, and wisdom and sharing and generosity as much as um, we did here. So thanks again, Anne, and good luck with the Mexico project. That sounds amazing. Thank you, Tara. It's been such a pleasure. And I'm sorry we didn't have more Q&A talk, and I'm hopefully Tara covered a lot of your questions, but um, feel free to get in touch with me. Yes. And thank you very much for this great opportunity. Love being seen in Melbourne. Oh, Definitely. All around the world. Thank you. I'm going to play the outro and uh, pop up the comments. Thanks again.